Are you looking for the perfect bracelet for a loved one? Would your man be interested in a personalized keyring from his children? Are you looking for the best priced jewelry, whether it be a necklace, ring, earrings, bangle, or even more? Look no further than Crafted Arts. Crafted Arts is a local business based in Barry within the Vale of Morgan, and they have a range of all the perfect items you need. If it's for the perfect gift for an anniversary, or maybe it's for someone's birthday, maybe something for Christmas, or you wanted to give someone that perfect gift that will last a long time, Crafted Arts is the business for you. If you want to know more or see what they have in stock, then you can visit them locally at 29 High Street, Barry, Villa Morgan, CF627 EB. Or you can go onto their website at www.craftedarts.co.uk. You can even email them at info at craftedarts.co.uk or maybe just give them a call at 077-89-94248. Trust me, it's worth it for the perfect gift. The best thing about Creative Space is that we don't just want to encourage people in being creative in TV, film or even theatre. We also want you to be creative in a variety of other things as well. So do you want to have experience in making jewellery? Do you want to pick up a hobby but do not know what to take or where to start? Then look no further than the Veil Jewellery Workshops. Veil Jewellery Workshops provides the best experience in teaching you how to make the best sterling silver jewellery. They will help you make a range of silverware including rings, bracelets and many more pieces. You will learn the basic silversmith skills such as soldering, texturing, shaping and lots more. Not only do the workshops provide the experience for adults, it also provides the best experience and fun for children as well. So if you want to learn on how to make sterling silver jewellery and if you're very interested, go onto their website at www.veildewerryworkshops.co.uk or get in touch with them via email at info at veildewerryworkshops.co.uk or even phone them at 07789794248. Hey guys, how's it going? My name is Reese Deans of the Creative Space Podcast and on this episode today I have none other than actor and YouTuber Brandon Hardesty. Brandon started out in YouTube right from the very beginning when it first started with many many gags and video clips of funny humorous voices and uh, obviously he did the reenactments. So it was such a thrill because when I first started watching YouTube, he was one of the first YouTube personalities that I came across and I fell in love with his YouTube channel straight away. But also he's been in films such as Bach Got a Room and American Pie Book of Love and so much more. So, so, so much more that we sat down and talked about. Now, I must say this now, we normally do the recordings on Zoom and sometimes I'm very fortunate to speak to the person in person if you know what I mean but normally on Zoom I, I never had a problem touch word until this particular episode it was kind of similar to David Brin's one where there was repetitive voices on the other end and it turned out it was on David Brin's side but with Brandon's my video footage uh, was not really doing much it was glitching and it was full of static and I, I did not know what happened but after an installing zoom and reinstalling zoom nothing much happened afterwards but that was only until I finished doing the podcast with Brandon. So if you hear both of us talking about the video and the problems that was happening during the podcast uh, just keep in mind that it was a technical difficulty on the video front of things not on the sound quality of things which is a good thing because normally creators base podcast relies on the audio format and not the visual but normally with the visual format I heavily rely on them if I want to put out a clip so I may do a video in the future but for now I hope you guys enjoy this podcast it's me and Brandon Hardesty on Creative Space Podcast. I'm actually really uh, grateful that you're on my podcast because I've watched you since I was a kid on YouTube and I came across um, your podcast, um, your YouTube channel when I was, uh, how long How long ago has uh, YouTube been around for now? How long is it? It was, um, it was like the tail end of 2005. I remember sort of first hearing about it 
uh, maybe like the beginning of 2006. At least that's when I started like uploading videos to it. Yeah, yeah. And I think I was about 10 or 11. Now I'm 26 years of age. So I was about 10 or 11 when I first started watching YouTube videos. And wow. um, your videos are reenact reenacting films and uh, famous movie scenes. And obviously you were making uh, funny little voices, little noises on the videos. And I was loving it. I was loving it every single minute of it. And what really made me impressed with your caliber, with your talent, is the fact that you were up for any challenge. And one of the challenges was um, when you did De Untergang, uh, the famous Adolf oh, Hitler. Yeah. And I really wanted to know, not not the, obviously the, the approach of doing that particular scene, but also the fact that you had to learn German. Um, so I just want, <laughs> I just wanted to know how, how long did it take for you to actually get it word for word perfect in German? Oh my God. Well, I think, first of all, I think the reason for wanting to do that one was because at that time it, it was still sort of making the rounds as a viral scene. People would take mm. that scene from Der Untergang and they would, they would create their own subtitles, like, you know, it would create some other weird situation that Hitler was in. But like, um, so learning German, I didn't learn German at all. I had done um, a reenactment all in Spanish from Pan's Labyrinth, or I guess, Al Labyrinto del Fauno, uh, from uh, Guillermo del Toro. And that was a lot easier. But, but German was tough. I actually got in touch with a former teacher from high school who taught German. And I asked her, like, can you write this out phonetically for me? And is there, I kind of knew what I was saying sentence by sentence, because I would be watching the scene as I was doing it. And uh, I did it the best I could. And I think I sent it to, <laughs> sent it to her after I did it. And she's like, oh, it's okay. <laughs> Some of it sounds like gibberish. So it was really, I did the best I could. I think that was one of the only ones, the only reenactments I uploaded um, outtakes of, because it was, it, it, some of it, the the wording just devolved into straight gibberish. I kind of, I couldn't, I, it was barely what he was actually saying. When, um, because, what was the whole point then of doing these reenactments? Because I, I remember we're just going staying on to the Untergang. Um, I seen that video go around, around, around uh, the, the globe because of many people taking uh, social issues, political issues, culture issues, and yeah. just, just funny scenes. And they would just change it to just the, I mean, here in the UK or in Wales or whatever, I mean, we are so regarded with our, love for our football clubs and everything that um if if a team like i don't know for argument's sake manchester united or or liverpool one of those teams and if they had a very bad uh few games that they played um <laughs> i i don't know it, it would be like hitler having a go at some of the players and and if you go and <laughs> it, it would just be something stupid but so brilliant at the same yeah. time yeah, like Hitler would might be deluded at first, like, ah, oh, well, we'll win the next one and then we'll be fine. And they'll be yeah. saying, no, but we're, we're, we're out of the running. You don't yeah. understand. The war is lost, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and it goes, and then they're saying, oh, the manager, God damn the manager. This is a disgrace. <laughs> Why did yeah. they suck him? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, was, it, was it always YouTube? Was it always going to be YouTube? Or did you just find it the perfect opportunity to to do something with it, to, to make something of it as a hobby or maybe as a career path? I know it eventually did become something that your people are familiarized with yourself to you, but was it always going to be YouTube? Um, For years, from the time I was 12 years old, I would always have like a camera. And I would just play around with stuff. And by the time I was going into college, I was maybe, you know, 18, 19, I had filmed a few of the reenactments. YouTube wasn't around, but I was just, it was just fooling around. I loved movies. Um, I loved, uh, I would 
quote movies all the time and, and I, I thought it would be funny. I just was up one day and I thought it'd be funny to reenact a scene from Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. And there were more things that got me excited about it, like how stupid it could be. Like, oh, I can get lint from the dryer and scotch tape it to my face as a mustache for Grandpa Joe. And, oh, this desk could work for Wonka's desk. And you know, it was like, it was just things that got me excited. I'm, I'm used to, I grew up pretty much an only child. My sister's 10 years older than me. So I, I was used to having time by myself to just do stupid shit. And I had filmed three or four reenactments before youtube came around and i just liked showing people videos that i made i would also make videos with my friends and bring it over parties like oh look at this you know this video we made and, and at the time all there was was a friend of mine set up a server that i could upload the reenactments to and so if i wanted to show somebody like hey look what i did the other night i would type in the server address and then we'd have to download the video and then and then watch it and then right around March 2006 was when I discovered YouTube. My friends and I were all huddled around the laptop like, well, look at this. I think the first video we watched was, um, I'm the juggernaut, bitch. And it was some guy dubbing over old X-Men cartoons. Uh, and I thought, well, I could upload the videos to that. And then the more I uploaded, the more things kind of took off. It was a, it was the the timing was good i kind of was able to ride this wave of when youtube started to get really big in 2006 2007 so that was kind of it was always it, at first it was a hobby i was majoring in film in college i had no idea what i wanted to do so it was just something fun i was doing on the side and then it mm. slowly evolved into other things what are the things that i you mentioned uh, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. And funny enough, I'm going to ask you this because I've always wanted to know that Grandpa Joe has somewhat become this, uh, I don't know, internet villain because <laughs> yeah. of he, because, oh, he couldn't get out of bed because he was lazy. And look, the family are living in poverty. That old bastard could have got off his ass and get a proper job or something like that. But then it was it was funny because um, we were talking about this in school and obviously there's the original with Jim Wilder, and then you got the Johnny Depp version. And I thought a lot of people said, Oh, that grandpa, because we were watching the classics, oh, that grandpa Joe, he should have got off his ass and blah, 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 blah. And I always turn around and say, Hey, hey, at least if you're going to do it the comparison, at least Jack Albertson's Grandpa Joe, it took him a four minute song and a child actor to get his ass out of bed, whereas the, in the Johnny Depp one, he just saw the ticket and literally just got up. And I'm more annoyed at that Grandpa Joe than that one. At least he, at least it took a song out of him to do yeah. that. <laughs> that. That's true. He had to sort of learn how to walk again throughout the song. And ah, oh, Charlie, get my legs. And it just it slowly worked it out. Yeah, the other one just was sort of miraculously healed, <laughs> as if he went to a like yeah like a religious healer or something. Um, um like. But it was, um, and one of the things that made me remind of of you, and there's so many actors, and um, so many actors that every time I I watch you do these reenactments, there's a handful of actors that I just see that oh my god, he would be if they were to make a, a film or a play about this particular actor or that particular actor, you'd be the perfect one. And obviously, you do amazing impressions of Christopher Walken, uh, <laughs> hands down, Christopher Walken. But the one actor particularly that stands out is john candy uh, yeah john candy that was um when i would so eventually when i moved to la and i started taking acting classes one particular class i went to for years and um my teacher would always say like you know because of the way you look you know you're you're you're, you're overweight you got this comedic element to you uh you I could, when you get, he would tell me when you get older, I could see you working like crazy. Like you just so these supporting roles and characters. And he would, he would compare me to John Candy sometimes, but I don't have the, the thing with John Candy is he was like a seasoned improv guy. Improv scares the shit out of me. I tried it once and I couldn't finish a, a class. Uh, I don't like it. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess I, I, I would have, I, having a career like John Candy, you can't complain about that. I would love that. 
Do you think? In, do you think? I I wanted to ask you about John Kelly. Do you think where would he be as a comedian in today's time? In 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 terms of just him as a as an actor as a comedian, just as a one of the greats, basically. Where would you see him now if you were like if he was still alive to, uh, today? Oh my god, I could easily see him doing great dramatic work as he got older because the, it was there you could see it in planes trains and automobiles you could see it in uncle buck you know he there was this heart to him this really um this beautiful heart to those movies that i could easily see him it, kind of the way louis anderson when he got older and he i think he won an emmy for for playing zach galifianakis's mother in that show baskets where i think he could have easily gone the route of doing some great dramatic work and still you know and still be funny of course but kind of the way you know jim carrey bill murray robin williams the the way that they're they're so inherently funny and then there's this i think to any comedian especially those that are have so much experience like them there's this real there's this kind of darker side where drama almost comes easier and that's something i kind of learned as i took more classes is that drama is easier than comedy comedy's tough it's harder for a dramatic actor to do something comedic than it is for some some a comedian to do drama mm. in, in general that's sort of been the consensus i've come yeah 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 i was i i, I agree with you as well because when i was uh studying uh, GCSEs, A levels, and going on to university, etc. There was always that. Um, uh, uh, in the UK, we always have the shows of pantomimes where uh, every Christmas we'd always have the, the pantomimes, and it's always the comedic parts that I always go for. And the one thing that I've always dreaded was not the fact that I can be have that confidence of getting up and acting silly and being funny, because um, sometimes uh, to be, I I think to be, I wouldn't put myself up up there up there is like a to be a good or great comedian or funny man but it's like to be a really good one is it's got to come with confidence and natural ability um but the one thing that always worried me was uh originality or something new or unique is you don't want to fall into that category it's like um will ferrell as much as i love will ferrell films and i i love him as a comedic actor i'm at this certain moment in in my of him watching if i'm watching a film of what will ferrell i'm sort of gonna know that he's gonna scream or he's gonna shout he's the shouty funny man he's always gonna do it and as much as i i'd love it i just know that oh come on will you could do better than that i loved you as george w bush <laughs> <laughs> right and yeah i it, it does come with it yeah it does come with some uh, you got to test yourself, and that's why I always feel like, oh, what what can I do t- ten times better than what I did before? And when it came, it's like I know you've done com- comedy before, um, but how do you approach comedy? Do you approach it in a certain way? Do you uh, do you just uh, imp- improvise in a sense that you just flow with it, just go along and see what happens? How, how do you do it? I mean, I mean, yeah. I'll, I mean, you're talking to somebody also who hasn't, I haven't acted in several years. I haven't been taking classes, but when I did, comedy always came harder to me because it's, um, I'll give you an example, I guess. I took like a, a three week intensive course class and all it was, was uh, you're getting scenes from previous sitcoms or even pilots that hadn't been picked up. And there would be a scene and there would be so many, it's almost like you'd read a scene and you'd have to find clues as to what could be funny. And everything, and every sentence ends with a period. There's no exclamation points. There's no parentheses that says, you should say this a certain way. But it's, they're always supposed to be as bland as possible, kind of a blank slate so that they give the actor the opportunity to sort of come up with their own interpretation. And it was always this real struggle for me to, it was like a 
like like a scavenger hunt trying to and also trying to find the clues that the writer left in there where they may want me to say something like a certain way but they're not going to say it in the script they want to know if me as an actor i'm going to pick it up if i'm going to be smart enough to pick it up um as as far as approaching comedy i mean i think the only way to do it as far as like doing a scene is to just try it in completely different ways. This is actually a rehearsal technique. Going back to Christopher Walken, this is something that he does where you go over a scene and you'll do it like, I'm gonna do this scene as if I'm a used car salesman and I'm gonna be a real skeevy, like talking fast, like, hey, 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 how you doing there? Hey. And then I'll do it again like a Baptist preacher, really over the top, like I'm proselytizing. And then I'll do it again as Elvis. And I would never do, the final product is never going to be doing it as Elvis, but you might find something in there, the way Elvis pronounces a certain word, or there was a little flair you did physically as you were in character as Elvis, that might become a part of the final product. And the final product could be an amalgam of all these different things. It's like putting a bunch of different coats of paint on and then seeing what works. So as far as comedy and even with even with a dramatic scene, I think that's a good way to rehearse and try and prepare and figure out, you know, you might find something unique that nobody else would have ever thought to do. Um, and that's another that's something that uh, Crispin Glover does very well. He's a very unusual actor. And there have been roles that he's taken, especially one he did uh, in a movie called River's Edge where he, the way he approached this character, the director thought he was ruining the movie uh, because it was hmm. so out there. Uh, but in the final product, it works like crazy. It's a standout performance, in my opinion. Um, did you ever have any famous faces, maybe someone like Christopher Walken or um, any other actors see any of your reenact reenactments of their film or film in general and gone... Yeah, you were, that was really good. Or fair play to you for doing that. Did you ever had that? Well, <laughs> I did. Yeah, when I the first movie I ever did was called Bart Got a Room. It was this indie film with William H Macy, and I didn't have any scenes with him on on set, but I did meet him at a premiere in and, and the, it was the Tribeca Film Festival, and I shook his hand. It's like, oh, it's, it's great to meet you, and. Um, and he said that he had seen my YouTube videos because the director had sent them to him. And I said, hey, I'm going to do a Fargo reenactment for you. He goes, oh, okay, great, great. And then he commented on it when I did the, I think if you probably, the video's still up of the Fargo reenactment. He commented on it, told me how good a job I did. Same thing with Eugene Levy. I did one of uh, him. I did a, an American Pie reenactment. And... There was one. There was one actor. He. I didn't do a reenactment of any of his work, but his name's Barry Bostwick, and people might know him from Rocky Horror Picture Show. Was his big break. He played the mayor in Spin City, this American sitcom, and he's you know, he's all over the place. I worked with him on a Scorpion King sequel, and he um, he just came across as a real genuine guy. And he asked me, uh, so "I heard you do some videos. You know, send me the link." I was like, "Yeah, sure." And then I think the next day he, he had watched a bunch and, and he said, um, you, you're you, like, he gave me a really sweet compliment and he goes, you're really talented. You should really keep doing this. And it came across as sweet, but then I thought, well, you know, it's just like a compliment. It, it could be genuine, could be not. And then as near the end of the shoot, he, he we give each other rap gifts at the end of the shoot. And he gave me his gift to me was a picture that we took together. And all it said on it was, I meant what I said. I was like, wow. It was like, it was a be beautiful, like a an extra compliment for me. And it felt nice. It was one, that was one of those things that kept me going, you know, when I was out <laughs> there in LA all alone, trying to make it, you know? <laughs> um, so of all the reenactment videos, I think you kind of answered this uh, this question when you when we mentioned the Untergang because of the bloopers that you mentioned. But was there ever another difficult reenactment that you you look back on and think, God, that that was difficult to make, or 
that was a challenge in itself. Yeah, there was there was an event that I don't know how well it went over at the time, but they were ex- YouTube was experimenting at the time in 2008. They did an event called YouTube Live, and it was featuring all a bunch of big YouTubers at the time. And they asked me to do um, some hosting stuff. It was in San Francisco. I went there and I did like interim hosting segments like, oh, and here we got, here's Bo Burnham playing a song or something. I didn't introduce him, but, um, and they, I proposed like, how about I do five reenactments and I'll have people vote and I'll, I'll have people uh, comment in a YouTube video what reenactments I should do. So it was five reenactments that I had to do in a short period of time. And that was really grueling. I got to the point where the last two were just scenes from the dark night because that was making the rounds everywhere. Everybody's talking about Heath Ledger. And I just remember being up until one, two in the morning, again, still in my parents' basement with Joker makeup on and the a vest that was way too small for me that I found at the Goodwill and and just screaming and trying to get this scene done. Like at that point, I was like, this is work. This is not fun right now, but I have to get this done because they needed to screen a clip of it at the event. So that was tough, probably. That was like, that was a grind. And I, I didn't, uh, although it ended up working out and the video got a lot of hits because it was promoted on YouTube live. I didn't want to put myself under those constraints again, because that was really tough. When you did the But Got a Room film with William H. Macy and obviously Jennifer Tilly, uh, was it because of the reenactment films and the YouTube videos that you did that got you notoriety that made you um, be not sort of selected i i don't know the the full story which i'm gonna ask in a minute but did you have to did you get called up to to an audition or was you pick picked um because of your talent that you did on youtube what is the story of bot got a room uh, got a room and your your time doing it yeah so um a producer of the film uh, i think his name is jay he saw a video that I did, a reenactment from Goodfellas, which was the, what am I, funny? I amuse you and make you laugh. I'm here to fucking yeah. amuse you scene. <laughs> and based on that, he wanted to, he, he talked to the director and he, he got in touch with me, he wanted me to audition uh, for a role in the movie. And I put myself on tape. I think they were in, they might've been in Florida at the time because that's where they shot it. Or they might've been in LA. Either way, I was sending them tapes of auditions and then they'd say, do you know how to play the drums? I'd be like, I can figure it out. Got a set of drums because my character had to play the drums in the movie. But yeah, it was based on a video and I did have to audition, but then they eventually cast me. And uh, yeah, I flew down to Florida for three weeks. It was my first first film shoot and it was, I was terrified, but I, but they made me feel comfortable. It was a lot of fun. Um, yeah, and I that was that was it. I'm friends with the director to this day. The director is his name is Brian Hecker. He's an amazing screenwriter. He's sold several scripts over the years, and right now he's um, oh, this is off topic, but he's like the number one rated Uber driver in LA in Southern California, <laughs> and he loves talking to people and he writes scripts in his spare time. So <laughs> anyway. When you did, because uh, obviously you did a, a reenactment scene from American Pie, and then you eventually did an American Pie film. Was that uh, a huge, I, I'd say, a huge moment in a sense of, oh my God, you know, it's an American Pie film. And I, I did one of the reenactment. Did, was you really excited and delighted to be doing one, uh, an American Pie film? Now I'm, now I'm curious. I'm, I'm wondering if, if I did the reenactment before or after that, I'm not sure. I might have done it after because I wanted Eugene Levy to see it after I worked with him. But um, yeah, so at the time, um, I had a manager and I had an agent, but I, I was still living on the East Coast. I was working at a grocery store and uh, I was, I think at that point, I had put college on hold for a little bit to just see what would happen with this acting stuff. 
And they sent me an audition for American Pie Presents, The Book of Love, put myself on tape, got it. And, and that was that, that was huge. I, I I still knew, like, I know this is a straight to DVD thing, but this is still like, you know, Universal Pictures. And they flew me out to Vancouver for six weeks. I'm in another country for the first time. It was a blast. It was so much fun. Um, made friends, learned so much about being on set and how to conduct myself professionally. Uh, it's just fun. I, I can't, it, it, and it was, and there was this sense of momentum at the time, like, oh, wow, you know, they, 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 I got cast in this. And then while I'm on set, or while I'm shooting that, I get an audition for uh, an Adam Sandler movie. And I got that part. And at the time I'm thinking, wow, this is, this is uh, some good momentum going. Although the Adam Sandler movie turned out to not be so well received. It was Bucky Larson born to be a star, mm. which I, at the time when it was released, it got like a 0% on Rotten Tomatoes, but still I don't, I didn't give a shit. I'm, I got to meet Adam Sandler. I got to meet his friend, Alan Covert, who helps write all his movies and helps produce and Nick Swartzen. And yeah, it was just a crazy time it was just a lot of good stuff happening yeah yeah well, well yeah what was what was adam sandler like then to 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 work with and be around it was very it was a very brief meeting i'll say mm. that it wasn't like a, all i knew going into it is that he really wanted me for this part and he was trying to negotiate with the um the producers of american pie to work around my schedule so i could get off uh, set on American Pie and then fly to LA and shoot for a day and then come back and then shoot a second day when the American Pie shoot was over. Um, but yeah, it was a very brief meeting. He he just came on set one day. He goes, hey man, how you doing? Nice to meet you. I shook his hand and it was just real, you know, he was just showing up to set one day. He was just to see how things were going. So it wasn't, didn't get like one-on-one -on -one time with him, but his friend, Alan Covert, who is the star of Grandma's Boy, everybody's seen him in all the Adam Sandler movies. He was an incredibly mm. nice guy. He was just totally open to questions and just talking stuff out. Um, whole experience was positive. Yeah. Do you know what? Let's let's give it one last uh, shot with this camera. And if it doesn't work, I'm not going to care about the okay. camera glitch because it is... Cause, uh, <laughs> It's one of those things where, right? Oh, hello. There he is. I'm done it. There I am. There I am. And watch now. I'm going to be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what's going to happen. Be like video drum in a minute here. <laughs> yeah. Long live the flesh. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I watched uh, that for the first time last year. That's wild. Oh, uh, do you know what? I was, I'm going to be honest with you. I was nine when I watched that film. Oh, my and, God. Yeah. And uh, I, I'll tell you a, a funny story. One minute. It was, um, I, I remember my uncle used to have, he used to have a collection of loads of rated R way in the, in the UK's certificate 15 and 18 films and mm -hmm. the, but hardcore rated R films. And I would, and it was his fault. I'm blaming him. Um, I would be watching, I would watch Scarface um, at the age of seven and wow. go in, and go into school the next uh, day uh, saying to the teacher, you need people like me. So say goodnight to the bad guy, motherfucker. <laughs> point <laughs> your fucking finger. Yeah, point <laughs> the fucker. I said, that's go, the bad guy. Go take a quailu, man. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and at one point, I was being sent away to the head teacher's office. And I went, look at the pelican fly. Look at the pelican fly. <laughs> 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 and my nan, and my, nan um, uh, my grandmother, um, my nana used to say, um, she, she, uh, she had to come and pick me up once, and she just looked at me and went, "Reese, what did you do?" And I just went, "I went. I said, say hello to my little friend." <laughs> <laughs> and she literally turned to my uncle afterwards because he was living with us at the time, uh, living with him at the time, and she went, "You got a hold. He got a hold of your films, and he went, "It's not my fault. What have I done wrong?" <laughs> he, went, <laughs> he, like, he walked in. He's got a hold of him. He said, you better hide him. Didn't hide him because the following month, this is where I didn't even last watching this. And brace yourself here, Brandon. I yeah. watched Can Cannibal Holocaust. Jesus. I've never actually even finished that. No, I didn't finish that. But the, the, <laughs> most, the most psychotic thing 
that happened when um I watched that thing. And when I say psychotic, it was the fact that 20, 25 minutes into the film, I said, this film's shit. And I just turned it off. <laughs> <laughs> that might have been why I turned it off. I don't know. That's funny. And I was I was like seven or eight years old, and I just watched Cannibal Holocaust and Scarface and uh, what have you. <laughs> Man, did anything ever scar you for life? Was there a movie that you watched where it stayed with you because you watched it way too early? Or did you just, were you able to handle those things? Um, well, the thing is, I love my Indiana Jones films, but I can never get that picture of the the scene where the, the, the arc opens and one's head shrinks and the other melts. And it, it just stayed with me. And I was like, oh my God, what happened? Did that, how... <laughs> What is that? <laughs> Definitely, man. Yeah. Do you know what I'm really happy now is that touch wood, I'm touching wood right now in every single place surrounding me. My camera is working. Yes. Yes, it is. Nothing's <laughs> nothing. Everything's great. You're not yeah. glitching at all. No. Did, did anything happen like that for you? Did um, Because I'm uh, for any any film like that. Because uh, especially when, when I watch Scarface, yes, in, in some ways it influenced me for good or bad reasons. And the good reasons are I was I, I appreciated the acting performances because I loved um, Al Pacino. I love Robert De Niro, Daniel Day-Lewis and Robin Williams. Watch Scarface so many times that I literally got into trouble in school. <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. and, uh, and at one point I told my uh, drama teacher in GCSEs when I was 15 years old I said oh I remember when I did that and I remember when because I was because in primary school I, I don't know how what the school system's like in America um but in we got primary schools secondary schools and then we there's an option when from you're 16 to 18 years old you could do a levels mm-hmm. which is which is like GCSE 2.0 and then you can either go to university or instead of a levels you could go to college um then go on to university i i don't know what's mm-hmm. like but primary school you you're basically there when you're i i don't know uh, four five to 10 or 11 years old yep. and then and then 11 years old to 16 years old in gcse's and then so on so forth but primary school i was such a naughty kid unbelievably naughty because i watch so many rated r films <laughs> <laughs> that's fun. Uh, I, I never watched um i didn't get into rated r movies when not that my parents wouldn't let me watch them i mean i watched some things that were on the edge of questionable like i remember being obsessed with back to the future when i was eight you know, or like things that are kind of fun adventure movies that have some adult elements in them. I was obsessed with Disney movies. I was obsessed with I'll Back say. to the Future. Oh yeah, and I'm which is great. Now I have I have a three and a half year old son who is I'm excited to get him into Disney. I got him singing Gaston and Part of Your World. You know, it's like at night now um, when I put him to sleep. But uh, I think the one movie that actually scarred me was I saw The Sixth Sense in theaters when I was 12 years old. And that was like, that movie's rated PG-13, which 13 years old or older, but was, I don't know. That should have been an R, man, because that scared the shit out of me. I slept with the lights on for years. Because <laughs> like, there's a scene where Haley Joel Osment gets up to pee, and then like a ghost just kind of walks by with like, Bruh. yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. I was just like terrified to pee <laughs> in the middle of the night. But you know what? I- I was more, oh, how old was I when I watched it? I, got, I had to be about nine or 10 when that film, not when that film came out, but obviously on DVDs. And when mm-hmm. I'm looking through the vi- the video library of my Uncle Tony. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Uncle Tony sounds awesome. Yeah. Um, I, it's either, it was either my, well, I got two uncles on my, because then both my mums, because my mum's the oldest out of three of them. I got my Uncle Tony and my Uncle Gareth and they had their video library of the decades and um uh, my uncle told me he introduced me to to gangster crime and ironically adam sandler movies um it, my very first adam sandler film was the water boy because i'm a big massive wwe fan oh there we go it's happened again <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> uh, do you know what i'm, I'm just gonna carry on i, I don't care now all right um, whatever yeah it's fine uh so i i remember um i'm a big massive wwe fan and uh, he he turned around and said, "Oh, the big shows on 
uh, on the oh, water yeah. boy. And I was like, I want to go and see it. But he was—he only had a cameo appearance. And this was around about the time when WCW was still around. And he was, uh, obviously, he was the giant in WCW, but he played Captain Insano. Um, yeah. And I was like, I got to see this film. And I watched the film. And he was only in it for that scene with Chris Farley. Uh, and afterwards, I thought, when's the big show coming back on? <laughs> oh, man. Oh, that's disappointing. <laughs> yeah, I know. Very disappointing indeed. And so afterwards then it it sort of became this infatuation of because oh there was wrestling uh wrestling here wrestling elements there because i was into my wrestling more than anything and that's what got me into trouble the most as well in school because i kept tombstone pile driving a lot of my friends and uh <laughs> yeah and some um, cousins who did the same thing they get in trouble for the exact same stuff <laughs> yeah so in in the end it was just my and then so my uncle Tony was the wrestling, the Adam Salem films, and some gangster films, some crime films. But my uncle Gareth, he loved his horror, absolutely mm. loved his horror. And funny you mentioned about did anything scar me for life? Nightmare on Elm Street certainly did. Um, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> you watched that at the right age, I'm sure. Oh, did I just watch it at the right age? There was Scream, Nightmare on Elm Street, um, Halloween. Uh, mm -hmm. Halloween, but no, no Friday the Thirteenth. I was not introduced to that until Freddy vs Jason came out. Um, so yeah, it, there was a lot of films that I should not have been watching at the right old age from seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven years old because oh, the, the things that the things that I've seen, but it made me have a bit of an imagination of not not go into the full extreme amount but i remember uh growing up is i do sketch works and story and there would be like a death or there'd be a murder or there'd be a there'd be a this and and the amount of times my my uh my grandparents and my parents would uh, say to each other we're gonna have to take our uh little reese to the psychiatrist <laughs> oh my gosh <laughs> yeah um and it's so interesting just thinking about that now i'm thinking about my son growing up and being around seven or eight and wondering if I'd be okay with him watching movies like that. And yeah. I, I, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. I'd like to think that I'd be fine with it and that he'd be able to separate, you know, imagination from what's on the screen. Yeah. Are you looking for the perfect bracelet for a loved one? Would your man be interested in a personalized keyring from his children? Are you looking for the best priced jewelry, whether it be a necklace, ring, earrings, bangle or even more look no further than crafted arts crafted arts is a local business based in barry within the vale of morgan and they have a range of all the perfect items you need if it's for the perfect gift for an anniversary or maybe it's for someone's birthday maybe something for christmas or you wanted to give someone that perfect gift that will last a long time crafted arts it's the business for you. If you want to know more or see what they have in stock, then you can visit them locally at 29 High Street, Barry, Villa Morgan, CF627EB. Or you can go onto their website at www.craftedarts.co.uk. You can even email them at info at craftedarts.co.uk. Or maybe just give them a call at 077-89-942-48. Trust me, it's worth it for the perfect gift. The best thing about Creative Space is that we don't just want to encourage people in being creative in TV, film or even theatre. We also want you to be creative in a variety of other things as well. So do you want to have experience in making jewellery? Do you want to pick up a hobby but do not know what to take or where to start? Then look no further than the Veil Jewellery Workshops. Veil Jewellery Workshops provides the best experience in teaching you how to make the best sterling silver jewellery. They will help you make a range of silverware including rings, bracelets and many more pieces. You will learn the basic silversmith skills such as soldering, texturing, shaping and lots more. Not only do the workshops provide the experience for adults, it also provides the best experience and fun for children as well. So if you want to learn on how to make sterling silver jewelry and if you're very interested, go onto their website at www.veildewerryworkshops.co.uk or get in touch with them via email at info at veildewerryworkshops.co.uk or even phone them at 07789 Interesting. 
but it, it it made me become the person I am today because when I I I will tell you a, another story. Um, mm-hmm. So I was how old was I? I got to be about eight or nine. And one of my favorite actors of all time is Tom Hanks. I admire Tom Hanks. I worship the any film or the if he was to walk in this room, I'd melt. That's how, how much. The guy means to me, and one of my favorite films of his was obviously Forrest Gump, mm-hmm. and um, we were obviously I live in a town called Barry, and me and my friend Jake we went out, and we were out with our mothers, and our mothers went into this clothes shop, and we we're like we're not going in there, we'll just stay outside, and I had some sweets, and my friend Jake said to me there was this lady who sat on a bench. And he went, go and reenact that. Uh, Hello, my name is Forrest, Forrest Gump scene. But, but do it. And he went, do it in, obviously, the Southern accent, but do it in your actual name. And I went, all right, then. So I went over and I went, hello, my name is Ray's, Ray's Dings. Would you like? <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't have any chocolate with me. All I had were these little gummy jelly tots. And I went, would you like a jelly top? <laughs> What was the reaction? She took a jelly top. <laughs> All right. Well, then, then, then you were so enmeshed in your character that she bought oh, yeah. it. In, in the zone. <laughs> and in all fairness, though, I think she saw the funny side because she, she was trying not to laugh. She knew what I was doing and uh, she uh, went okay. along with it and being a kid. But she was actually, every time I asked the question in this <laughs> Forrest Dean's uh, character, my mate Jake would be in the background going... <laughs> <laughs> like that laughing his head off and then, and then obviously the, the woman there is just taking it and she's lovely and then in any the end when our mothers walked out of the shop i broke out and i said oh thank you for you know not telling me to get lost and she was like you made my day i can't wait to go home <laughs> <laughs> that's great that's cool yeah. i like that um so going on to obviously you did american pie you did uh, a couple of films and the one the one TV show that also had a profound effect on me was South Park Mm -hmm. as, as any show would have a profound effect because it it insists on making an impact wherever it goes. But I mean, when you did that episode playing Eric Cartman, I think that alone is sort of like a, I mean, I would have loved to have played Eric Cartman in any way, shape, or form. But for you, what was what did Matt Stone and Trey Parker want from you when playing Eric Cartman? So all I knew going into the audition was that these are going to be live action versions of the character and sort of a reenactment spoof of one of these shows that people would tell their real life stories about how they survived some horrific you know, battle against nature, hanging off a cliff or surviving in the forest. And um, I think I did, I I did one read, uh, no, wait, I I went in and they just said, just read it as straight as possible. Don't try to do an impersonation. And so I just did it seriously. Like, I think one of the lines was like, what was, you know, just, just being earnest about it and angry. Like it was your idea to take a zip lining, you fucking Jew. And it was like completely, you know, ridiculous. And and I so I got the part. And uh, now I'm I'm as I'm talking, I'm taking my one of my headphones off because I shouted that pretty loudly. I don't want to make sure that my kids didn't hear me just shout that. <laughs> um, anyway, <laughs> so um, so I got the part, and yeah, it was exactly what they wanted. They just wanted it to be. <laughs> this ridiculous actors playing the kids were all in our mid twenties and I could tell that they were having fun with it. It was a lot of fun to meet both of them. They were incredibly nice. Um, when Matt Stone first saw us in our costumes, he just like burst out laughing and he said out like, this is so fucking stupid. This is great. <laughs> like you could tell this was one of those ideas that they had, but they were just excited about. Yeah, And uh, we were, yeah it was fun it was that was great we got a picture with him at the end like it was i got to meet two of my heroes and we did a second day of shooting because they wanted to pick some stuff up i was like yeah let's go hang out again you know did do you know what um i know you did loads of filming recordings etc however is has there ever been a moment for you where you considered doing stage work 
whether it be a musical, a straight play. I, I would love to do stage work. And I would say I did two high school plays back when I was in high school. And I'm, and I'm still an introvert, but in high school, I was really backwards introverted. I had my little group of friends, but I, you know, I didn't, I don't, I don't like talking to people. I don't like performing. And I had a teacher who suggested after I did sort of a, an acting class, she goes, you try out for the play. And I, it was, I it was the most anxious I've ever been doing both of those plays. Uh, one of them was the crucible. And then, um, but I oh, really, really enjoyed it. And See, and I, I'm the opposite. Sorry to cut you off then. I am the complete yeah. opposite. I, I love Arthur Miller's plays, but I did not enjoyed the crucible when i did the i i there was oh, who did you oh, play john proctor well that's i mean that's the lead right i mean that's tough oh <laughs> uh, yeah it was it was not the the toughness um wait a minute go on talk about what you say and i'll talk about oh no that's um, okay but, and so uh, it, yeah. it, it was like i i played reverend hale and um i just I remember I, I had never gotten so much positive affirmation about something. It was like after I'd, I'd be done, it was just, just the, it felt so nice to, even though it scared the shit out of me to do it. And I, it was the first time I felt, Oh wow. So maybe I'm like good at this. And I always loved those experiences. And then when I got to LA and I'm auditioning for film and television, I'd say to my manager, I was like, could I just, could I audition for a play? I mean, don't they have theater out here? And my manager would tell me just not to waste my time because it's not, it's not as big of a theater town, I guess, as New York. Um, but uh, I don't know. I should have fought back on that because I would love to do something on stage. The only problem is now it's such a, a, a time suck. Like you have to, I remember how much of a grueling process it was just, to, just in high school, you know, and trying to find the time to rehearse for it'd be a full-time job which i don't have time for i got two kids I already work part-time um so but sometime in the future like yeah i would love to do stage so i'm sorry continue so you did john proctor you did not enjoy your experience no i did not enjoy experience because when when we did it it wasn't for a school play it was for an examination and uh, i i uh, there was a part of there was a part of me i went a bit more posh English and I'm Welsh. It's like it was a part of me. Um there was a there was a part of me that felt like ah oh, because John Proctor, like you said, oh it's the lead, it's John Proctor. It's it's um it'll be fun to do. That was going in my head at first. And then when I got the part and then did the rehearsal, it was just uh, th there was a there was something about it that made me feel like ah this isn't for me. This is not for me. And I remember one of the classmates who did went for John Proctor and was really disappointed that he didn't get it. He actually turned to me and said, you shouldn't have been John Proctor. I shouldn't have been John. I should have been John Proctor. I've got this. I've got this. I've got the looks. I've had this. And I remember just staring blankly at him and just went, well, you haven't got him. So there we go. And <laughs> That's a Proper response to that. Yeah. And, but then I look back and I think, do you know what? I should have turned around and went, can we swap balls? Because if I knew what I was getting myself into, I would have enjoyed playing Reverend Hill. I felt that he was more of a better character for me. Mm -hmm. uh, my teachers felt like uh, he, that character wasn't, but there we go. And I remember uh, my drama teacher, who I'm still very close with today. Uh, this is for A-level, this was. Mm -hmm. Um I remember uh, she said, right, Reese, you got to be tense. You got to be shouting a lot. You got to be this. You got to be that. I was like, and I'm taking every word that she's telling me. And, uh, and so I did it. And I remember the results came back. And for my coursework, it said 58 out of 60. Now, that should be like an A or an A star in the terms of the coursework. But no, the examiner gave me a low grade B. So we, I was looking at my teacher and I were looking at that thinking, no, no, that shouldn't be it. And then they looked at my performance as John Proctor and the examiner grade me, I mean, the lowest is F and he gave me an E. Um, He said he was shouting. He was shouting too much. He was, he was not very convincing as John Proctor. And that's why I look back and think, yeah, because I felt like I didn't do it. I didn't do the part justice, you know, and. Well, I mean, 
that it, it, the thing about shouting is like it, it feels good when you're doing it it feels very cathartic to be yelling in a scene but that that can be like a, a little bit of a trap as an actor where it's like you, you think you're you think you're bringing all these emotions to the surface you feel good in the moment doing it it feels cathartic but then it doesn't come off uh as you know it's like it doesn't come off as a full-fledged character so i could see that and mm. that's i would say that's maybe nothing against your drama teacher that may have been some poor advice yeah but in all fairness that in my first year because i i did three years in a level even though you're supposed to be doing two mm -hmm. um so i had to reset a year but in all fairness uh she's Alex Williams said to me, you don't have to take the coursework again because we're doing exactly the same thing with the other year group. So how about um, you you take a couple of months off uh, off this drama course because it's, it's practically the same. Keep turning up to the performing arts lessons. Keep turning up to whatever the lessons I had because I did film studies, performing arts, theater studies, and other one or two other courses. So for the next three to four months, I didn't go and do the course, uh, the coursework. Uh, my teacher resent it, and ironically, it came back same as ever, A, came back as an A. So I did not know what went wrong there, but mm. then she said to me, "Right, are you going to listen now?" Because I was a bit of a, oh, I th think I knew it all because I wasn't just assessed on uh, the crucible. I had to do a monologue as performance and she wanted me to do Oedipus on the bit where there's this big monologue where I've got the bandages over my eyes there's blood everywhere because I gouged my eyes out but I said I do not want to do Oedipus um, and now a part of me thinks I really want to do Oedipus um, and I said I want to do a monologue for One Man Two Governors which James Corden did I want to do that famous um, talking back and forth scenario and my teacher didn't want to argue with me so she said, all right, you can do that. No problem. And I know why she did that. She wanted me to fall into this trap of that's the reason why. That's the reason why uh, I let you do that, because I wanted to teach you a lesson. So are you going to listen to me now? And I was like, yep, no, no problem. A lot more in depth. I mean, it would go forever. But she she knew I had something, but she knew that. I needed a bit of a wake up call to say, right, this is not how it's, you're, it's not going to work your way. It's going to work one way or the other. So mm -hmm. she so she said to me, right, this is what we're going to do. You're going to do this monologue. And it was from The Glass Menagerie. And yeah. and it was and it was the famous monologue where he goes, I am the dynamics czar of the underworld, ma. You know, and there was that famous monologue. And then she wanted me to play the chief Indian in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Oh, um, okay. Yeah. So she's like, I know you can do those two. Go and do it. And Obviously, she directed me on those performances, and I remember opening up the letter to say A A A A A on the performances and everything. So I was like, "Yeah, um, what what do you want me to do now?" So uh, I'll I'll shut my mouth now. What do you want me to do? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So was oh, there? Ever... Yeah. So if you were to. Here we go. Here's a question for you. If if there was ever a moment that you wanted to do a play in 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 uh, California, in New York, wherever, what play would you like to do? Oh, I would love like I'd, I'd say a dream role for me. I don't know if I'm too old for it at this point, but I'd love to play uh, Seymour in Little Shop of Horrors. That's like, uh, my, yeah, it's one of my favorite musicals. Um, I I think I can sing enough for you know in the same way that uh, uh, Rick Moranis could carry a tune. I I, I would love to do that. Um, and as far as something that's not a musical, I mean I I don't know. It, it, something like maybe Twelve Angry Men. <laughs> oh, I'd love to do Twelve Angry Men. <laughs> that would be great. I I feel like. Uh, if I get old enough, I could I could I could pull off the character. I mean, I forget the character because they're all just numbers. But Lee yeah. J. Cobb played him in the original. Oh, uh, number three, number three in the end. He goes, "You can't prove we didn't get to the door." Yeah, <laughs> you spent all your time hobbling around the room, but you can't prove it. Yeah, but I haven't. Did you yeah, see just... the William Friedkin one? No, I, I haven't. Oh, um, what's his name? When what's did his that name? come out? Oh, that was in the nineties. 
Yeah. And I'm tell I'm telling you now, um, you had Jack Lemon who played what Henry Fonda played. Okay. Um, and who's the guy? Oh, what's the guy's name? I can He's do a always IMDb work here. Hold on. Yeah, I'm Hold gonna on. do that now. Now because uh, I- I'm trying to see. Is it Gregory Scott? Is that his name, Gregory Scott? George C. Scott. George yep. C. Scott. Him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And- I could see him doing that very well. Oh, it- trust me. He did do a brilliant job. And James Gandolfini played a brilliant during number five. Um, oh, Courtney. S- stacked cast here. Tony oh, it-, <laughs> <laughs> it was. Yeah, it was. It was such a big cast. And but nothing could beat the original. As as the mm-hmm. saying goes, nothing could be the original. But I think because it was made for television, you can you can't find it anywhere. The the really William Friedkin version, you can't mm. find it anywhere. It's it's not on uh, Netflix or anything like that. And when you try and find the DVD, the DVD on eBay costs a lot of money. Um, mm-hmm. It's it's a very rare entity, and I just happened to be fortunate to watch that when YouTube permitted it to be on YouTube. Oh, it got taken um, down, and it got taken down. But I got the classic in my DVD cabinet or somewhere over there. And I don't know, there's something, yeah, with 12 Angry Men, there's something about that film or even just the story in itself that, you know, it's so relevant regardless of time and era. It could, oh, yeah. it could work anywhere. And especially with when Jack Lemon and George C. Scott did it, okay, they altered it a bit because they wanted to make make it set it in the current timeline when it was made and released etc to be relevant but the story can go on for it, it stands the test of time it's it's up there in the top 10 where it will never get old it can always be done mm-hmm. and it's i can see you doing glenn gary glenn ross and that's one I, of my favorite plays i would let the glenn gary glenn ross i would love to do glenn gary glenn ross i did a reenactment from that actually it was the the scene that wasn't in the original play. It was the Alec Baldwin coming in, doing the whole speech. But I remember I've done scenes from that in acting class. Always enjoyed it. The dialogue is so fucking juicy. Um, Glengarry Glenn Ross, um, Death of a Salesman, probably. Mm. I don't know. There's, I would j- just, just anything that's like just real meaty like that. I, I kind of don't care what it is. I, I just want, I would love to be on stage. And I don't care if it's, you know, I, right before COVID hit, I was uh, looking for acting classes nearby, you know, because I had just moved back home uh, from LA. I moved back home in twenty late 2015, and uh, I fell into this job that I still do where I make videos for IMDb about character actors. And I just kind of go through, well, it used to be character actors. Now it's just kind of any actor, but... I, I made a, um, just backtrack a little bit, I guess. I made a documentary web series called No Small Parts about character mm. actors. Made it long form, half hour. The goal was to like make a first episode and pitch it somewhere. But then I just kept making them for YouTube. And then one day, managing editor for IMDb came to me and said, can you make these for a few of these for Comic-Con? And I responded and I made a video and like a day i was like i could do one of these for you every week and then it's been been doing it for like six years now um uh but right before when covid hit i hadn't acted in a couple years and i was like all right i want to get back into it i got a little bit of time and i started looking up classes you know some in dc some in pennsylvania you know maybe one in new york but that's a four-hour drive and then covid hit and i was like nah, i can't do anything now so I would love to get back into it eventually. You know, the thing is there's there's no time limit on it. And I've, I also had to be mentally adjust to the fact that I can be happy not acting. Like I don't need that to have some sort of fulfillment in my life. And, and, and if, if you're in a position where you do think that, I think that's a dangerous mindset because you never know when things won't, be working out because there will be a year that might be great and then a year where you got nothing mm. so mm. The, i was going to ask you then because there was a moment uh during the height of the success on youtube where you released a lot of reenactment videos and a lot of um 
uh, small bits and pieces of videos, etc. But there was a time where you took a long pause in making YouTube videos, etc. And I was when I was doing my research, there was a video that was about yourself, and it was going through your career and everything. But there was like long pauses. Was it because you felt? Did you feel in in a sense that you felt burnt out that you could only do so much, or did you feel, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Did you feel that? you wanted to take that pause, a leave of absence, just walk away for a minute so you can worry about your own well-being. So what happened during that pause for you? Yeah, so it was... Now, at the time, I was uh, at the at the height of all that. I was dating my... Who is now my wife, Shana, but we were doing long distance. We would see each other every three, four months. My whole family was on the East Coast. Everybody I knew was on the East Coast. And I had made friends out in LA, but I was very lonely. And during those periods of time where the phone wasn't ringing, or if I had an audition that, you know, I didn't get the part, it would, I was really discovering that I was prone to like major depression. And it took me a while to sort of realize that. So it was, and there were a lot of factors, you know, like, yeah, depression, um, anxiety with, auditions working myself up until like just nervous sweat and feeling like I can't eat you know it, it, I was like killing myself trying to be a certain way for casting directors and I was also getting sent out on auditions um, for a lot of comedy stuff because of the YouTube videos they'd think oh well he's like a professional comedian but I had no experience in stand-up improv scared me and I would go in for auditions that I knew like I wasn't right for the role because the, this is a lot of improv that they're asking for, but I'd have to go in anyway. And then it would be a kind of humiliating experience, at least in my mind. And they just go home and drive me deeper into a depression. And it was, it was just, it, it was tough. Um, and I also had this, uh, this kind of mindset that I want to be on like, yeah, the YouTube stuff is great, but what really matters is I want to I want to act in a film. I want to I want to act. I want to be on TV. That that's where the real clout is. And I wish I had had the foresight to realize no. The only reason that these managers and agents were interested in me in the first place was because the sheer number of views I was getting on YouTube videos. To this day, it's more valuable to have a YouTube following in your own little pirate ship of fans and followers than to you can completely sidestep anything on film and television and just do your own thing on YouTube and the YouTube can lead to opportunities, but I shouldn't have um, seen being on being in movies and on television as more valuable in the eyes of whoever Hollywood than YouTube. So it was a mixture of uh, trying to preserve my mental state uh misinterpreting what was more valuable and just yeah I guess being burnt out too because from the very beginning in my head I, I remember being in, interviewed by an agent who wanted to represent me and they asked me what I wanted and I said I just want to make enough money so I can get married and get a house and have kids and that was like the number one goal for me and that never changed and I was looking around me at other actors who were getting into their mid-30s and they still hadn't settled down they were they were they were making an ultimatum like uh, I I want to be successful first and then start a family and in my head I'm thinking I don't want to do that like the clock was ticking for me in terms of what I wanted in my life so it was like I just I forget how to put it. Well, I it's just what I wanted, and oh yeah. So I at first I was totally fine with this life of you never know what's going to happen every day. It could be could be nothing. Could be a lottery ticket to a series regular on a TV show. And for a while, I was I loved that lifestyle. And then after a while, I was like, I want stability. <laughs> like I'm not happy anymore. So that's when I slowed down on YouTube, tried to focus more on myself. I even went back to school uh, to change my 
degree to early childhood education. Because it's also another thing I've wanted to do is to be like elementary school teacher, preschool teacher, work with kids. And I thought, let me just settle down, focus on something that could be uh, like something that could provide more stability. And that's when I came back home and just slow down on YouTube stuff with the exception of making the no small parts stuff, which then turned into something else that led me down this other path. It was so odd. Like I started going back to school and then I had to not, I had to stop going back to school because then this other thing with IMDB sort of took off. So I guess that's where I was at with why I slowed down with the YouTube videos. And I also, I guess part of me didn't want to keep doing the same thing. And I wanted to explore something else, which is why I guess I started doing the, the, the no small parts web series. Mm. And I don't know, to this day, I, I would, I, I miss doing the YouTube videos, but I haven't really thought of anything that gets me excited about mm. uh, uploading content like that again. Um, and when I do, I'll, I'll upload something. I have other, you know, I'm so ADD. I have different ideas and projects that I'd love to, I'd love to pursue, but only if I'm really excited about it. Hmm. Are, you, are you happy now? Is that the important thing? Are you happy now where you are in the position? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Like it was, came home, got married. My wife got a great job. I got a great job. We, we, we got a house. We moved a couple times. I have two kids. Like the family, like, like Vin Diesel, man. Family, <laughs> family, family. <man>. family. <laughs> but in all seriousness, like th this is what life is to me. You know, I'm work. I, I I work part time making videos for IMDb, and the rest of the time I am taking care of the kids, driving Noel to school, taking care of the baby, uh, cleaning up around the house. You know, it's just trying to find this balance. I mean, it's real hectic, real hectic right now with a toddler and an infant. And it is, it's, it's very stressful, but it's a season of life. And I'm, I'm, I have my family, like I'm, mm. anything else is a bonus at this point. If I get back into acting and find success doing it, great. But what's great is it'll be on my terms. I'm not, I don't have to be in a position where I need this job to survive. And that's a horrible position to be in if you're auditioning, because you're looking at every audition as this could be the life-changing thing. I could pay this off. I could do this. I could do X, Y, and Z. There was a great interview with Brian Cranston. Uh, and I know he said this before in, in other interviews, but I, I listened to him on Howard Stern once. And he said that uh, when he was younger, this young, hungry actor, he would go into auditions thinking that way where he'd think, oh, let's see if I get this. I could move out of my shitty apartment. And I, I, I'm really behind on these bills and I need this job to survive. And he had this epiphany where instead of going in with that mindset, because going in with that mindset, you give off maybe subconsciously and you don't even realize it, this desperation to a casting mm -hmm. director. And that does not smell good to a casting director at all. Like, ugh, ugh. It's almost like going on a first date with somebody and being like, hey, hey, I'm really excited about our date. Hey, I, you know, <laughs> like being <laughs> way over the top about here's some flowers here's some chocolate boy i'm really excited about how this is going to go do you want to have kids like it's too much <laughs> but then brian cranston he had this epiphany where he's like i'm going to go into every audition and look at it as this is my opportunity to do what i love for one person in a room and i was like and that his epiphany became my epiphany i remember having that mentality and switching it and then i immediately booked two big jobs like it, I don't know if it was coincidence, but it was it. That's a good mindset to have. So anyway, the point is, if I were to get into acting again, it, there's no pressure. It's not like I need this for my life. I need it now. It'll just be if it happens. Great. You know, and it could be on stage. It could be on in, in short films. I have a buddy of mine who lives close by and you know, he asked me to do come shoot on a short film for a day. I was like, yeah, of course. It's just fun, you know? So that's kind of where I'm at. Do you know what I noticed as well when it came to, when you mentioned Bucky Larson, uh, Larson and uh, um, and he didn't do well, 
in in terms of critic uh, critique and box office etc and then the golden raspberries came about etc and one of the things i noticed one of the things i noticed was that you were very outspoken on how child actors should not be anywhere near the golden raspberry awards even if not even considered and do you know what i fully agree with you on that statement and um do you think this is like a double bill kind of question mm-hmm. um do you think the golden Glo- uh, the golden globes do you think the golden raspberry awards is sh- do you think people should take them seriously in a sense that well, if they're saying that you're the worst things, then you you are the worst things. Do you think they should take them seriously? And second of all, do you think um, the Golden Raspberry sh- should take them uh, self seriously and approach things diff- seriously in different matters? If you know what I mean, especially i.e. with the uh, the child actors that no, you you cannot nominate them because they're child actors. This you know it could well it has it has ruined a lot of child actors' futures. Mm-hmm. I.e., um, the uh, who's the actor who played um, the young Anakin? Oh, for Jake my, Lloyd. Jake Lloyd. It that affected Jake Lloyd terribly, mm-hmm. and you know, and 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 a victim of what? I, I don't want to say Hollywood, but maybe main um, mainstream movies and uh, big blockbuster movies can do. So, yeah, what do you think about the Golden Golden Raspberries Awards, and especially how they approach these particular kinds of films when it comes to nominations? I just don't like cynicism. I think it's too easy to to. I think it's it, it's too easy to uh, to say something is awful, you know. And I think I think the golden raspberries. I I I get the idea. Like if if you if you kind of weave it a different way, it could be just like a bit of fun poking fun at something. But the way they're done now, it's like, I don't know. I haven't gotten any sense that they, not a lot of sense that they uh, are doing it as kind of a joke where it's, it's, it seems more like they're taking it a little bit seriously. And I think it's a little disrespectful. I like, I used to, I used to, when I was younger, I'd say in, in as a teenager, I'd look at straight to DVD movies and be like, God, that looks like shit. Who would make that? You know? And then after working on a couple of straight to DVD movies, it's like, there's a lot of people that put in some hard work on movies that aren't necessarily very well received. Then maybe they don't get a, maybe they don't get a, uh, you know, a theater release, but it's, uh, it's just, I don't know. It's a lot of nice talented people that have come together to make something. And seeing the behind the scenes of the of just the crew members and the props department and the set design i don't like i don't like putting people i don't like putting people down who have worked hard on something um and i guess case in point bucky larson yeah came out had a zero percent on rotten tomatoes i myself went to the theater with my wife to watch it we, we walked out after my scene and we walked across the hall and we just, and Contagion was showing. So we watched that instead. It's mm. not, ob- objectively, I don't think it's a very funny movie, but I respect everybody who worked on it because they were really, you know, they were, they were trying. And I, I think, I don't know, if you're trying to create something and it doesn't turn out well, there's a way to, there's a way to criticize and be respectful, I think. And, mm-hmm. and, you know, I hadn't really even given the golden raspberries a second thought for years, but then when that, uh, when they nominated the young actress in the Firestarter remake, uh, uh, it, it angered me because uh, it, it, they nominated Jake Lloyd years ago. And I, from personal experience, my manager represented Jake Lloyd. And she told me that he got death threats every day of his life as a kid mm. toxic fan base of adults who saw the, who thought that he ruined the, their movie and essentially ruined this kid's childhood like he'd go to school and just be bullied he how do you, as a kid you're getting death threats from grown men you know like what does that do to you so mm. you know I'd, how much of an effect the golden raspberries had on that 
maybe they were just kind of maybe he fans were already having that reaction and golden raspberries jumped on that as a way to promote themselves um but uh yeah yeah leave the kids out of it yeah <laughs> yeah literally that's why i was like on the this particular golden raspberries obviously my favorite actor tom hanks he's been nominated not for one but two performances one as geppetto in pinocchio and um the other one as uh, Colonel Parker, Tom Parker and, and Elvis. And mm-hmm. I, I sat back and I was like, I, uh, this is where I just think, oh, come on, Golden Raspberries. You, you clearly either not seen the film. Well, maybe Pinocchio, but, but I don't blame. I thought Tom Hanks' performance as Geppetto was actually really good. And that's not me being biased, but I just thought he, he, he held it his own, despite the fact that I think what made Pinocchio not well received was the fact that it over relied on cgi effects and the fact that the fact that disney itself not even robert zemeckis ironically who, who contributed to back to the future and he's a ter- terrific um director in his in his own right um it's just the fact that disney are heavily relying on uh golden classic films that oh let's try and make a quick buck or two on on nostalgia it's like mm-hmm. come on come on it's like, come on, don't do that. You, the reason why Disney is built like this big empire now is because, oh, I do a bit of more adaptations, do a bit of more uh, live action films, but don't go dragging the legacy of the classics into the dirt because they were good back in them days. Mm-hmm. Like, just keep keep doing more animations for Christ's sake. You know it's working there, but who am I to know? I'm not on the I'm not on the board of directors of uh, Disney to say that. But at the <laughs> same, but at the same time, it's like I I watched um. When I watched Elvis and and Elvis playing Tom Parker, and when he got the nomination, I had to look back and see what um, the Elvis Presley family, all the Presleys, had to say about uh, Tom Hanks as Tom Parker, and they all said the same thing: he was Tom Parker. It, it was right right down to how uh, manipulation. I'm thinking if if the if the Presley family are saying that, and the Golden. Raspberries is saying, I'm thinking, no, I'm going to go with what the Presleys are saying and not the Golden Globes saying, oh, it's the worst performance ever. Because I thought he was brilliant, but Mm -hmm. oh, I just... uh... You know something that is... he he's making choices as an actor he's trying it's not like he's thrown in the towel and he's just kind of, "Eh, whatever. That would be that would be more of a of a, you know, I wouldn't nominate him for worst performance, but but I, I, I would... I would think less of Tom Hanks, maybe if it seemed like he wasn't trying, but you can tell obviously from his, just the man's legacy that he gives it his all. He's making choices. Some of them may be riskier choices than others, but his career has been full of risky choices. And I appreciate, even if I don't like a performance of his, I appreciate that he's still at it and he's still obviously very passionate about it and trying. He's making choices. Mm. So, and I I don't like, you know, it, I don't think you should get down on somebody for trying. Yeah, yeah. Uh, last question for you now, Brandon Hardesty. And thank you for being on the podcast. And apologies from the technical difficulties. I'm going to have to look into this um, with Resume if it's needed an update or something. But thank you once again for being a guest on the podcast. Of course. My, my final question is, how do you look back on your career so far? <laughs> As far as the YouTube videos, I find it hard to watch them because it's a different person. I mean, we're talking about, man, 16 years ago when I first started uploading videos. Um, but it, it's it's nice that, that it's there. You know, there's a nice little chunk of videos that will just live on forever. <laughs> um, <laughs> the movies I've done, I remember more of the experiences than... Uh, you know, just I, I, I just a, an education and the, the, learning how to conduct myself on set. You know, it's it's all been incredibly rich experiences. I got to travel to Canada. I got to travel to Romania to do the Scorpion King sequel. I've just been fortunate. Um, looking back on it, it's all, you know, it's all helped sh- shape who I am. Uh, I've got a, I've got a decent resume of movies on there that I can, that could help me get some future jobs. But in the end, I guess I look back on it and I had a great time 
and it was just a, a nice little white, white hot time and place when uh, I got to learn a lot and experience things I would have never been able to experience. I guess that's it. I guess I could, uh, I don't know. I, I can't really think of anything else to say about it besides that. It was just all a good experience, good life experience. Are you looking for the perfect bracelet for a loved one? Would your man be interested in a personalized keyring from his children? Are you looking for the best priced jewelry, whether it be a necklace, ring, earrings, bangle, or even more? Look no further than Crafted Arts. Crafted Arts is a local business based in Barry within the Vale of Morgan, and they have a range of all the perfect items you need. If it's for the perfect gift for an anniversary, or maybe it's for someone's birthday, maybe something for Christmas, or you wanted to give someone that perfect gift that will last a long time, Crafted Arts is the business for you. If you want to know more or see what they have in stock, then you can visit them locally at 29 High Street, Barry, Villa Morgan, CF 627EB. Or you can go onto their website at www.craftedarts.co.uk. You can even email them at info at craftedarts.co.uk or maybe just give them a call at 077-89-942-48. Trust me, it's worth it for the perfect gift. The best thing about Creative Space is that we don't just want to encourage people in being creative in TV, film, or even theater. We also want you to be creative in a variety of other things as well. So do you want to have experience in making jewelry? Do you want to pick up a hobby, but do not know what to take or where to start, then look no further than the Veil Jewelry Workshops. Veil Jewelry Workshops provides the best experience in teaching you how to make the best sterling silver jewelry. They will help you make a range of silverware, including rings, bracelets, and many more pieces. You will learn the basic silversmith skills, such as soldering, texturing, shaping, and lots more. Not only do the workshops provide the experience for adults, it also provides the best experience and fun for children as well. So if you want to learn on how to make sterling silver jewelry, and if you're very interested, go onto their website at www.veildewelryworkshops.co.uk or get in touch with them via email at info at veildewelryworkshops.co.uk or even phone them at 07789 794248